And um, today we're going to be talking about how long we think lockdown might last and, and some of the considerations when starting to think about that. Um, so today I'm joined by Tim Spector and Jonathan Wolf, um, who are going to quickly introduce themselves before we get into today's discussion. Hello. Hello, my name's Tim Spector. I'm a professor of genetic epidemiology at King's College London and the main uh, scientific academic PI on this app project. I'm Jonathan. Uh, my background is in machine learning. I'm the founder and CEO of Zoe, uh, which we set up three years ago uh, with Tim to understand uh, our individual responses to food and how we can therefore predict what's the right thing to, to eat for, for ourselves. Uh, and I'm the other half uh, with Tim of, uh, of the team that's created the, the COVID tracker that I think many of you have been using for the last couple of weeks. Yeah, so thank you everybody for continuing to log. We'll talk about some of the metrics around the app and we'll get into Q&A after about 20 minutes of conversation with Tim and Jonathan. So you can share through your questions and um, I'm sure there'll be plenty to get through. So um, we'll come on to those at the end of the discussion. Great, so um, the first thing we thought we'd do, and apologies uh, if, if a few of you have seen this before, was just explain um, how we actually calculate the, um, the numbers from the data that, uh, that you're sharing. And there's, there's three parts to that. The first is um, uh, figuring out what symptoms actually best uh, explain the likelihood of somebody to test positive or negative for COVID. We constantly revise that as more and more people are doing tests and share that uh, on the app. And we use that then to uh, calculate for any individual based upon the set of symptoms that they show uh, whether or not they are going to have sim uh, symptomatic COVID. Then the second thing we do is we then estimate uh, across all the users of the app um, uh, the answer so we can understand that in each region of the country. And then finally, we extrapolate to uh, the whole of the UK um, by building a machine learning model that uh, takes into account uh, not just this data, but the location of each of these individuals, um, how, uh, how old uh, each of these individuals are, um, their gender, and now also uh, socioeconomic background. So many of you said, um, wrote in questions asking if we have stats for people using the app. And um, in order for Jonathan and Tim to talk about um, predicting COVID in the UK and then getting into lockdown, um, Jonathan is just going to take you through some of the stats of people using the app. Absolutely. And some of these sets we haven't shown before, uh, and a few of them are available, um, particularly the maps on the website. And one of the things that uh, we're now able to do for the first time from this week is actually to update uh, on the website every day a, uh, a new map that shows the very latest view of what's going on across the country. So in terms of age distribution, um, here you can see that um, there's a very broad uh, range of participants. Um, uh, you know, peak between 30s and 60s, uh, more than 50,000 now in their 70s. So that's significant growth uh, over the last week that is uh, great to see. Very small number of people in their 80s. Um, and one of the biggest questions that we had over the last um, two weeks was, is it possible to use the app to um, uh, fill in information for somebody else? Um, and the answer is, uh, it is uh, going to be available uh, in the next day or two, and we hope we will be able to fill in the, the over 80s. The, um, the second screen here just shows the number of assessments, and what you can see is really that the participation is amazing, so thank you, uh, everybody. Uh, you can see that um, you know, the dark bar is a number of assessments uh, each day, and you can see uh, a very big spike, obviously, on the first day, um, another spike on the 31st of March when we introduced uh, a, the ability to get online notifications. Um, and actually, uh, since then, the third biggest day is actually yesterday. So we're seeing continued and increasing growth and usage and a very large number of people who are logging every day. And then uh, final a slide here, and then Tim can, can tell you more about what all of this really means. Uh, for the first time, you can see a chart that shows the progression of COVID across the UK over the last two weeks. Um, and we're just each uh, update here is, uh, is the next day. Uh, on the left hand side, you can see where it's dark blue. This was March the 30th. It actually gets more blue over the next four days. And the right hand side tells you the total number of people aged between 20 and 69 that we predict had symptomatic COVID. And so you can see that uh, our prediction is this, this peaked 
on the 2nd of April. Um, and then you see this steady decline uh, coming down on the right hand side. Um, so we are, we predict a little over 600,000 people in that age group um, with symptomatic COVID right now. And if you look on the left hand side, you can see how um, the distribution has shifted uh, across the UK uh, through this time period. And all of that comes from the participants in the app, you know, choosing every day to share with us whether they feel uh, healthy or whether they're symptomatic. And so what this, uh, this really means is that what we're seeing is the first few days after lockdown, basically people were stuck together and the incubation period of the virus is, uh, we think, somewhere between three and uh, between two and five days. And so that's what we think explain that peak. So people had been infected outside. They then went and, and uh, went into their, with their flatmates and family uh, together. And that led to this uh, peak on the 2nd of April. And then everyone had been infected. And because people weren't then spreading it to other people outside their, their small group, that's why we're seeing uh, this gradual progressive decrease, uh, um, which of course is never going to be absolute because some people are still going out to work, etc., and other people uh, uh, are, are locked in. But what this means is that two weeks before uh, we see uh, any changes in hospitals, for example, uh, we're, being, we're seeing these changes uh, in, our, um, in our symptoms. So it, it's we have a two week window between hospital and our symptoms. And I think this is very interesting. So if we go to the next slide, um, we can see um, that um, we've, we've tracked what's happening here and where we predict uh, things are gonna go uh, over the next, uh, uh, you can extrapolate that out over the next 10, 14 days, but you can see how much more data we're getting than just relying on the government's um, confirmed cases because they really haven't changed very much at all because they're totally depend on people coming to hospital and finding uh, someone who can give them a test. And that varies across the country in rather biased ways. Uh, and and Tim, also... Tim, there was one, one question here, just, just to make clear that this yellow line is the absolute number of people who currently are symptomatic with COVID. And so that means there will be people here who are getting um, healthier, there will also be new infections going on in this, and this is the total number. This is not the number of new infections um, per day. Sorry, just to be to, to clarify that. Sorry, Tim. Yeah, so it's, it, it will be a mixture of um, those that have it and those are, are getting new ones. It's not, uh, but we think it's likely that the numbers of new infections is going to be quite similar, just a slightly different time frame uh, for that. And we will hope to be calculating that in, in, the, in the days to come. So, this is a snapshot of where the hospital is going to be released, relieved of their burdens in, in a couple of weeks time. Uh, and that also uh, equates to the deaths because we're still seeing death rates going up, although the number of, uh, of cases that are infectious is actually going down. And that's because of this really important lag between the um, different data sets we've got, but also showing how important it is to see what's happening in the population so we can uh, make the predictions for the hospitals. Uh, so the question is, can our, your data be used to predict about hotspots uh, as this pandemic progresses? And this is, we had lots of questions on this. And the answer is uh, definitely yes. And if we, we look at this time series um, from when we, we, we had those, those peaks around 1st or 2nd of April, um, Obviously, it's it started off uh, quite strongly in London, and then we had these these peaks in South Wales, and um, we had some other ones um, in, in in Liverpool, etc. And now we're we're seeing less of a um, a difference between the um, areas. We're not getting that same big urban difference that we had originally, uh, but we, for example, are highlighting area of Lincolnshire at the moment, um, where, um, which is quite rural, but it includes a place, uh, a, a beach area called Skegness, very popular up the north for dipping your foot in the water. And that was very crowded um, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, 
uh, from people coming from all over the country to go to the beach there because of a sunny day. And uh, we think that might be the reason that that rather rural area has met many more cases than expected. And then other, other examples uh, around the country. And in Scotland, for example, one of the highest areas does seem to be in the, uh, the islands, uh, Orkneys and, and Shetlands, where we, we're getting. Uh, either we're seeing some new cases or we're seeing the, the, it's staying, it's not dropping as much as in other places. We can't currently separate those two at the moment. But definitely there are some good cases here and we're working closely with the the Welsh, I don't know um, if we have, Sarah, a map of uh, Wales specifically, but... Um, Not in this, but we'll share it. We'll share it on the website just after this. On, on the website, you can see if you're interested in what's happened in Wales. So we picked up very early these, um, these changes in South Wales that were fascinating um, around Newport, but also in an uh, area of the valleys, more rural, and uh, they, were the, they had the same rates as London. And... Uh, we also picked up an um, area of Anglesey that got a sudden influx and a high rates. And uh, that, in a way, was one of the factors that led the Welsh government to um, close down all the caravan parks in Wales, uh, because we alerted them that this was probably due to holiday homes uh, and people coming into the area, which normally uh, you wouldn't see uh, high density of these kind of infections. So we're working closely with the Welsh government and the Scots government at the moment to try and give them early warning of these so they can take some public health measures. Yeah, and I think one of the questions that we'll come on to later, but it might be worth you answering now, Tim, um, quite a few people asked how we're working with the government, how we're working with the NHS. Um, so this is an example in Wales and in Scotland, but then um, within England, do you want to share how the data is being passed on? Yes, yeah, so Every day I'm, I'm passing a summary to um, the people that you see on the television. That's the chief scientific officer and the chief medical officer and the various teams doing modeling at, uh, in Westminster. Um, and we uh, provide feeds to NHS uh, Wales and Scotland uh, in particular. Um, and uh, we've just had a, a call today to discuss doing the same thing with uh, NHS England. Um, but it hasn't, the interaction hasn't been as close with NHS England, I think because they're, they're, they are busy trying to uh, sort out their own app at the moment, uh, which we can discuss later. But is, it would be quite different, but they, they're worried that um, uh, it might confuse the issue if they started talking about um, uh, this app. So Tim, when Jonathan was talking about building this machine learning model to predict COVID, um, one of the factors going into that is predicting which symptoms clustered together can give us a good idea of who we predict within that model might be COVID positive. Um, so one of the questions that was submitted to us is, is which symptoms might indicate COVID and, and you've been um, working with the team at King's to publish some papers around this to share with the rest of the research community. Yeah, so one of the really exciting early findings we got from the app was uh, that, that there's many more symptoms than just fever and cough in this disease. And we're maybe just scraping the tip of the iceberg here, but, you know, just looking at uh, a dozen symptoms that are coming up frequently um, that weren't in the official NHS websites, or if you had them, you weren't able to get a test done. So we've been underestimating how important they are. Um, so what we did is we put them all into one of our models and saw we have about 20,000 people now that have had a, uh, a COVID swab test um, using PCR. And so we know that people who are positive and people are negative, and we use that in the model to see which symptoms uh, are associated with a positive test, because some of these might just be noise. And, you know, and that's always true for an individual. We can't be absolutely sure. But as a population, we could see these real trends. And it turned out that loss of smell, as you can see on this graph, um, gave us uh, an association. It's like uh, a six-fold risk, if you had loss of smell, of having a positive um, test uh, done by the PCR by swab. And that was much stronger than any of the other ones, which were also generally above the line. So the ones were skipping meals, fatigue, fever, um, delirium, cough, um, 
and diarrhea. They were the main ones that we saw. And the blue lines are the UK and the brown ones are a much smaller group based on less than 100,000 people in the US, but broadly uh, supporting what we're finding. That's not just a cultural problem. Only the British have, a, have poor taste. <laughs> it's a worldwide problem. So we, we, what we're trying to do is convince the government now to uh, change their mind and include uh, loss of taste in their panel of accepted COVID symptoms, which would allow people to get testing, which would allow uh, doctors with that symptom to be up to self-isolate, etc., before it's before it becomes a real problem. Yeah. So, so looking at the data that you guys have been analysing over the past few weeks, it's great that we now have a few weeks worth of data. Um, realistically, so Alana has asked, realistically, how how will we come out of lockdown? Like, what's the process that we we go into to do that? Um, and Tim, I know before we jumped on the webinar, the three of us were talking about some of these key questions that need to be answered that um, can can allow us to start thinking about a timeline. But I think, unfortunately, on this call, we can't say that we're going to be out of this in a month. Well, we're also not the people making the decisions. We're, we're the people looking at the data, supplying them to the people who will make the decisions. Um, uh, but we can we can all have our own opinions and everyone in the country does, I think. Um, and I think it's not going to be a simple case of, yes, let's go back to normal. I don't think anyone expects that uh, even for the next year, everything's going to go back to where it was uh, uh, three months ago. So it's a question of degree and every country is, is having a different approach to this. So I don't think full release is really going to be on the cards um, I think because otherwise it will just come straight back um, if we carry on without social distancing without um, uh, increased testing or segregating people etc and there so, were a number around partial release sorry to cut you off Tim uh, around partial release there were a number of questions that came in ahead of the webinar around whether or not um, we might have elderly people self-isolate for longer because they might be more at risk um, and staff and potentially um, those living in care homes? Yes, so part, they're all very sensible. I think that's, that's highly likely that we would protect the vulnerable. And my view is that that, that should definitely happen, but we should be releasing people uh, who are uh, younger, not at risk or who have been already exposed to the virus uh, and have had classical symptoms, for example. And as we go, as we're unsure whether enough people will have antibody testing or not, it could be that showing you've had the classic symptoms at the right time point might be uh, one of the ways that people might uh, be able to get out and uh, work uh, in this, in the, with this group uh, at high risk. Um, but other countries have uh, are starting to do this or a couple of weeks ahead of us in the, the epidemic. So in Spain, for example, um, they're, more, they're more relaxed with health workers now uh, going back and construction workers who are generally young and fit and uh, they've relaxed some of that on, on, on construction and transport. Um, I know that in Denmark, where they were the first to lock down, they've um, released uh, kindergartens and uh, some primary schools. Again, because children uh, really don't get any severe symptoms from this on the whole, uh, and they feel they've probably already been infected. And they're just trying to keep those groups away from uh, the older at-risk groups, but starting to unlock. Uh, and uh, in, um, in Italy, I know that they're, they're opening up some shops and things that um, uh, have previously been closed because they also realize that keeping people for long periods of time in a, in a very stressful situation is also not good and we need the health service to get back to normal because the other downside is you know people are still dying of cancer heart disease more than they would be otherwise so it's, it's trying to keep this this balance um, now the question about the second wave, um, 
the, we think that uh, use of the app is probably the best, fastest way to detect a second wave because um, we will see before you can get tested, before um, you'll have people going to hospital, uh, the ability of people to tell us on their app when they suddenly start to feel unwell in with millions of people, that's definitely going to be the best, fastest way to do it. Obviously, confirming that with testing would be great. Uh, and you, you, that will be done in a sum sample. But by the time you've been, you've gone to the hospital, you've had your test, you're talking about another four or five days. And four or five days in this kind of epidemic could be uh, uh, too late. Um, and finally, just a, a word about antibody testing. Because um, all these tests have to be realized that they're, they're actually imperfect. Even the swab test um, is, uh, if it's negative, it doesn't mean you don't have the virus. Uh, so we call this um, uh, a low sensitivity. So it, often you get a false negative result. Um, but it is, if it's positive, it's, it's virtually sure to be positive. And the same is also true for the antibodies. So from the data we've seen, and there are some antibody testing going on in the hospitals, I certainly know that in the teaching hospitals uh, where, where I'm, I'm working in London, um, but it only works two weeks after the infection. And again, if it's negative, it doesn't mean you won't get antibodies later or lower levels of antibodies. So there's no absolute gold standard here. So I think we have to use all the data we've got combined rather than picking one versus the other. So, and I think what we're doing with the symptom app and what everyone out there is, is helping us with by doing it is giving us this, this extra arm uh, that I think is going to be vital in the, the weeks and months ahead. I'll it. Jonathan, you had a, a word to say about contact tracing. Yeah, well, I, I think there are a number of questions um, around this because there's been some talk about, um, and I think Tim has mentioned this already, um, whether the, the NHS in England might <clears throat> release a contact tracing app. And this is basically um, the idea that your phone uh, monitors uh, everybody else that it comes into contact with, um, ideally in some way that is um, uh, at least partially privacy preserving, and therefore if someone is then detected as COVID positive, you could say, you know, here are the 37 people who came close to that other person. Um, I think that, you know, what the data that we've pulled together here shows pretty clearly is this is not a solution that's, uh, that's very helpful with the problem we have at the moment. Um, right now, even today, um, you know, the key message here is there are still a very large number of people who are symptomatic with COVID, which means that you know, if people came out of lockdown right now, we would see a big resurgence in infections very fast, and we have you know, nothing like the capability to follow up uh, all the uh, people that uh, more than half a million people came into contact with. So I think contact tracing is very interesting at the point when the, you know, the number of people who are infectious is down in the hundreds or maybe a thousand, which is a situation that um, we've seen um, you know, certain countries in Asia get to. But I think the for now, just as Tim is saying, um, the sort of solution that, that you're all contributing to, which is very large number of people in the country sharing their, their symptoms, means that um, we can understand the level of, uh, of infection across the population and therefore provide that information to you know, the NHS uh, across, um, across the country, as Tim said, is going to England as well as to Wales and um, in Scotland, um, and therefore understand as we start this partial um, release out of lockdown, which you know w will will happen, um, is that leading to an, an unbearable increase in infection rate? At which point, clearly, you know the lockdown has been released too fast, or has it happened in such a way that that level of infection is um, is low enough that we can also allow people to um, start to carry out? Um, their, their lives, including obviously very important things like children's education, people being able to go to hospital for other reasons, and of course, um, um, for many people, earn, earn a living. And I just say that, yeah, the, uh, we're not sure yet about in the next few weeks whether testing is going to be available for everybody or not. As you know, there have been lots of promises about this, and it's, it's very hard to imagine that in every part of the country is going to have... Um, testing at least for the swab testing for new cases so um, that's why we, we desperately do need 
to have the app uh, still around in, in several months time to pick up uh, extra surges so there can be a, a, a further lockdown if necessary very fast rather than waiting for the hospitals to fill over again. And, and so we are working hard to try and get NHS England to support the app. And if anyone else is out there uh, who's influential, um, do, do try and help us because um, we think we should all be working on the same side here um, and uh, uh, supporting all, all the technologies that work, not trying to uh, uh, sort of make them compete with each other. Because I think they've all got a role uh, in this at different parts of the cycle. Sarah, I know there's a bunch of questions. I had, I thought one I would like to pick up and one for Tim, and then I know you'll have, you'll have come up with a, a number of others. So one, I think there was a, there was, there was a, a whole series of questions around how, um, you know, what are the results in my area? And also, how, you know, what can I do to get better results uh, in my area? Um, so I think the first thing to say is that what we've just shown here um, is a summary. If you go onto um, the website, you'll see there's a link on the homepage to a page of maps. There's an interactive map in there and Sarah is just demonstrating. If you click into any part of that map, then you will be able to understand what the exact stats are um, for, um, for your area. And that includes the number of people who are participating. So I think there are, there are a number of questions around this. So Sarah, if you just click on any, anywhere, um, then you will see pop up uh, that in that particular example, um, it's very, uh, you're moving too fast. Very, I can't read very it. Very sensitive. <laughs> very sensitive. There are 888 people uh, contributing uh, into that small region uh, of, of the country. Um, and so that allows you to understand. And if you want to get a better understanding of what's going on in um, your region, it's very simple. You need to share the app with as many people as you can um, in your area and ask them to participate. Um, and the second thing, as I said, that we should launch um, by Friday is the ability for people to also participate for others. It's, I think it's, it's obviously very important. There's a lot of people who may be um, uh, either uh, much older or very young who are not able to use the app. Uh, and uh, it's sort of been the most um, demanded um, capability. So that was, that was one broad um, question. The other one that I saw came up a lot, Tim, and, and I think it'd just be helpful to, maybe if you'd answer, is a lot of questions around um, whether or not uh, it's likely that people who have had uh, the infection over the last uh, month are going to be able to be reinfected next month or whether they're likely um, to be immune because that obviously a big implication coming out of this data is, is, is our ability in, in the coming um, uh, week or two to try and predict the total number of people who've had um, COVID in different areas. What is, your, what is your perspective on that? Well, having spoken to some immunology colleagues, um, they believe that if it behaves like other coronaviruses or uh, SARS or MERS, which are the, the other similar uh, ones that came out of, uh, uh, of animals, you will get nearly everyone who's had a, a, a proper infection will definitely have immunity uh, for the first few months. Um, whether that lasts beyond a year or not, I don't think we know, but the majority of the immunology experts on vaccinations believe this should give you uh, some protection for around a year. We don't know whether that's partial or total. Uh, so it could be that you might get a very minor version of it if you've had it before. Um, but in general, uh, you will, most people believe in it hasn't been tested yet because we haven't seen the second wave of any size in uh, any of the countries so far. So most people who've had it can be reassured they're likely to have some form of protection. Um, there's a possibility that um, if you only had it mildly, you might not have as much protection as people who had it severely uh, because your immune system didn't really uh, build it up, but that's pure speculation. So, but certainly I've, I've had a mild case of it um, that lasted two weeks. Um, I tested swab positive, although I wouldn't have be classified as having the disease by the by the government and I'm fairly sure that uh, for the next few months uh, I'm going to be immune from it that's the way I'm hoping anyway uh, being optimistic. A few people have asked about Northern Ireland now I, I believe we were tracking users in Nor Northern Ireland um, but why are we yeah. not doing it any longer? Uh, the, we were 
talking with them and talking with the chief scientific officer there and it turned out that um, the NHS in Northern Ireland um, wanted to have their own app and so they uh, started promoting their own app um, and that meant that um, we got a drop off in Northern Ireland from people who weren't logging on anymore and our numbers dropped off so that we weren't uh, happy to give results. There weren't enough people in each of the areas that we were happy with it. In general, we could give a whole, we can give a whole figure for the whole uh, region, but not by area. So until they resolve that, uh, they're having an internal fight because only, only about 400 people signed up for their app, um, but they're still promoting it. So uh, there's some internal politics in Northern Ireland, but the scientists there are very keen to come back into the fold and um, start promoting this, uh, this one, which covers all the regions. We've got a question from Stuart uh, on how we can get more people to use the app. Um, I can answer that one. Um, so you can share it with as many people as, as you want to, once you've logged your symptoms on a daily basis. And we are working with the Scottish government and the Welsh government to notify residents in Scotland and Wales to, to take up usage of the app. Um, we have friendly companies giving us free ad space. We, you know, public, um, I guess, press are picking up the stories of, of using the app and getting the word out that way. But, um, the, you know, the thing that's been most effective is, is people like yourselves sharing it with friends and family. Um, so we're trying to do our best to, um, to get everybody to use the app without spending any money because this is a, a non -for, not for not for profit project um so if you've got any ideas please email us yeah and i just should uh, some people might have missed it but so we're near you know we're over 2.25 million people who've actually uh downloaded and, and and given us data on this app and about 15 million uh individual reports and so this is by far the biggest citizen science project uh, in health that's ever been in the world. And so uh, it, it's, it's a very exciting time here. So we need to keep this momentum going um, and see if we can get, you know, upwards of, of five to 10 million people, which certainly if we can, we can get uh, people like NHS England on side, that would be very, very doable. Uh, but in the meanwhile, just individuals themselves have got us this far, people power, just sharing it amongst themselves saying this is a good idea this is you know we can all do this together and as we um as jonathan said we're going to be introducing the idea that you can uh log in for a relative or, or an elderly friend uh who might not be as good at using apps that should be around uh, next week and so people can do that which i think will be equally important to try and capture that that group as well so all of you Tim, I think there's been a couple of other questions around um, like what else are we going to be able to, to, to do with this um, and maybe let me talk a little bit about the modeling then maybe you can talk about some of the other clinical work um, that is um, going on and some of the papers uh, that you're working on analysis. Um, so uh, in terms of the, um, the modeling, um, there are a couple of things. Uh, so one is that particularly uh, as we open this up and hopefully get some more people who are also older, we think we can build a more sophisticated model to predict whether or not people have COVID. One of the things that we originally started this project was with the belief that the symptoms being cough and fever were probably missing a lot of what was going on. We've already seen that as Tim has described, but one of the things that uh, we suspect is that the way that symptoms present is probably different depending upon things like underlying health and um, potentially um, frailty and some other things like that. So, so we plan to build a more sophisticated machine learning model. Um, the other thing that we're working on um, very actively is to try and build a prediction of hospital admissions based upon all of this data. Um, I think we all know when we, we started um, here, one of the great concerns was the ability for the NHS to be able to cope um, with the number of people. And even now, um, you know, I think that's the biggest driver for decisions around lockdown is a concern about overwhelming the NHS. Um, sadly, because of the delays that Tim was talking about, there's this very big gap between, you know, an increase in symptoms in an area and the number of people who end up being very sick in hospital. Uh, and we believe that 
through the contribution of everybody using this app, um, we can actually build an ability to understand how those two things um, go together and hopefully therefore help to, to really inform um, the government as we move into uh, a sort of hopefully a, 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 at least a partial release out of lockdown to understand from what's changing in terms of the symptoms patterns, does that mean that you know, healthcare is going to be able to cope in each of these regions? And Tim, do you want to talk a bit about the, the, the clinical side of what um, you're working on? Yes, yeah, so as well as trying to work out what these uh, symptoms are, we'd, we're also seeing certain patterns emerge that there might be four or five different types of infection, uh, clusters where some people get headaches and, and stomach problems, others where they get the classical fever and cough, and others where they get the loss of taste combined with these other symptoms. And they might have different risks of going to hospital. So uh, by identifying early what clusters of symptoms people have, we could maybe uh, alert them that they need oxygen earlier or this lot don't have to worry too much. Uh, and I think that's, that it's looking like there's perhaps five different ways you can get, uh, at least five different ways you can get this virus uh, and how it manifests. And all of them might have different um, trajectories over time and different prognosis. So that's, that's one fascinating bit. We're also finding out about well, lots of the medicines that people are on. Um, some of them might be good at protecting against the virus. Others might make you uh, more likely to get it. And uh, we're getting masses of data on these on the common drugs. So um, things like non-steroidals and, and corticosteroids, uh, very commonly taken, but also uh, anti-blood pressure tablets and uh, we should be publishing something soon on that next week. Um, uh, you know, and some of these will be reassuring, others might be making, you know, having a different conclusion. So, uh, and Tim, could you talk a bit about the public? There was a few questions about like, is the research being made public, the models, et cetera. Could you talk a little bit about that for an audience that's not all going to be academics? Yes, so um, as soon as we find something, what we're doing is we, uh, we tell the we tell the government um, uh, what what we've found basically that same day, and then we start to write a paper that's deposited in a, in a preprint form in an archive that everybody can look at, every journalist can see. So um, our, the summary of our analyses is being put out there within a few days of us doing it. We're not keeping anything secret. We are releasing it all to the public, and uh, every day all the data that you guys are bringing in is uh, being given to the, uh, health, the the NHS Health Data Research Repository in Swansea, where it's disseminated, and uh, other NHS scientists, etc., can also pour over the data. So we're we're trying to be as open as possible. We have a large group of about sixty or seventy scientists looking at it at Kings, and as soon as we find a thing, we're publishing it online, telling people about it, telling you here in these in these kind of meetings uh, to be the first to know and on our website. There's a question from um, Philip around the estimate for the percentage of population that have had the infection. Now, last week we predicted it was around 2 million. Um, do either of you have our latest predictions? Well, um, I think there's two, th go on Tim. Yeah, so we have gotta remember what we're talking about is how many people are infectious within a window of time. So uh, at the moment, what we said was at its peak, uh, there were, uh, and I think, um, Jonathan, it was probably about seven to 10 days uh, window. Uh, we estimated that 2 million people in the, in the UK had infection at that particular time. Now, there might have been people who had it before then, and there are definitely people who had it since then. So our data are really at a, like a week in time, how many people are ill and giving off the virus. Uh, that's how we're looking at it. So the statistics will all be different depending on how you define it. And we're working towards trying to work out how many people we estimate will have been affected. Um, say, you know, by the time we get to close to zero new cases, we can estimate from looking backwards, adding these time periods up. So uh, at the moment, 
you know, we're, we're at 600,000. It was, it was 2 million uh, two weeks ago. And maybe before that, it was half a million. So you might be able to add those up together to get a, a rough estimate. That's right. So at the moment, we aren't predicting the total number of people who we think have had the virus. That is definitely also a topic that uh, Tim is pushing <laughs> us on hard uh, to figure out. It obviously um, has some added complexity because you also want to try and capture um, a good view of people who are fully non-symptomatic. There's been a lot of discussion about that internally because we suspect that um, a lot of people who in these sort of small scale surveys and under other countries are told as non-symptomatic actually might have some symptoms, but they just haven't had the classic symptoms. Uh, and I think anosmia, uh, which is the loss of um, smell or taste is a great example, but we see a lot of other, um, uh, you know, rarer symptoms we're working through. Um, but I think that, you know, for the people asking this question, it's exactly the right question, because obviously if there is a very high, uh, you know, fraction of people in an area who have already had the virus, then you know, given Tim's view that you're unlikely to get reinfected in the short run, that actually makes the infection chain quite hard um, to continue, right, Tim? Whereas if you're in another region where you know they there is actually a small number of people in the region who have had the infection at all, then as soon as you move out of lockdown, even a very small number of people will lead to this growing. Um, and I think this is a topic I'm sure we'll come back to on on future uh, weeks because. I think it is one of the key questions as people are trying to think about how might you let people out is clear you'd sort of like to let people out that are uh, going to minimize the, um, you know, the sort of potential explosive nature of the epidemic restarting. Um, and of course, try to minimize the risk to, um, to particular groups, which is, is why I think, as, as Tim said, it, it's, it's very unlikely that there is going to be a complete um, release uh, you know, before a vaccine when clearly there are some groups that, that continue to be very at risk. And just the bits of question about how long does the infection last in terms of being infectious? And so generally we think, you know, it's, it's that first week, uh, generally five days of shedding the virus is when you likely to pick it up in a swab and then levels go right down. So it's very hard to detect it. And if it's hard to detect, it's very hard to pass it on. Now, but there could be uh, one in a hundred people or one in, we're not sure, whether well, one in a thousand that might continue low level, that keep the virus and, and do spread it. And so this is another reason that we're never going to completely eradicate this virus until the vaccine. Um, we, all we can do is manage it. And I think that's really what we need to be in a, a pragmatic view that there are going to be very low levels of this uh, in our population for years to come. And we just need to manage it and not try and expect that it's an all or nothing scenario. Sarah, I know we're almost out of time. There's one question here saying, I've been using the app daily. Is there a website where I can view the results? So do you mind just flashing up the, the website so that if anybody doesn't know where to find these maps and understand what's going on in their area and also read about a lot of the research that um, Tim and others have been doing. Um, there we go. Uh, COVID.joinzoe.com. Uh, and then uh, Sarah just showed, if you scroll down a little bit, um, the link to um, the maps, which are going to be updating um, daily from now. Um, and if you scroll further down, um, you will also see a whole um, series of um, uh, blog posts around various different um, research that's, um, that's come out of it. Yeah, so that's the place to go where, so to direct other people to, where they can download the apps. And also they can learn about what the whole plan is. So it's a, it's a one-stop shop, really. So everyone should, should know about it. So when you pass that on to anyone else, make sure they realize that that's a website as well as a, a place to, 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 just to download the app. Absolutely. We, we've got time for a couple more questions. Um, and then we'll take the rest of the questions and make sure that um, we answer them in blog posts in, in the next few days as we are um, publishing about once a day on the blog. Um, quite a few questions around masks, Tim. What's, what's your view on masks and whether or not people should be using them on a daily basis? Um, my view is that most countries have, have said officially people should be using masks and all the Asian countries normally do anyway. Um, if anyone's been to Japan and South Korea, they see that it's, a, a third of the population normally wear them. So culturally, it's easy for those countries to do it. Masks essentially 
um, in the population as opposed to in hospital um, protect the person not wearing the mask more than the person wearing the mask. So it's actually a, uh, an altruistic thing to wear a mask because you're less likely to infect someone else. Um, uh, that's the main benefit of doing it. And so if everyone wears them when they're, uh, or, or, or wears some protection, doesn't have to be a mask or a cloth over their, their face, uh, when they're jogging or, or running or going out, it means that if you cough or sneeze, uh, you won't be transmitting it um, uh, four or five meters in the air as aerosols. So um, the CDC in the US recommend that everyone wears masks. I think the reason we haven't had that recommendation here is the, the government didn't have enough masks to go around. And um, they had to look after the frontline staff first and um, even they have had short supply. So it's really crucial for those looking after COVID patients to have masks to protect themselves from large doses. But in the population, I think we can all use makeshift masks. Um, and uh, we may have missed the boat on this one, uh, but I, I suspect that for the next um, peak, uh, we'll have changed our tune and tell people to wear masks. And saying there's no harm in it. And there's, no one's shown any risk of wearing a mask as opposed to uh, taking lots of vitamins or chloroquine tablets, which uh, do have side effects. Well, I've got two final questions for you. Um, and I'm trying to also answer questions separately, um, directly to people. Um, the first question is for you, Tim. Uh, how do you feel about the approach of herd immunity in terms of tackling this? Um, until we know exactly um, how long that lasts, it's, very, it's a very theoretical question because, as I said, we don't know whether the immunity lasts for six months or six years uh, once you've had it. But certainly, uh, once you get, you need to get a, probably above 50% of the population uh, to have had it for that effect to start working. At the moment, you know, we're looking at less than that. And so it's, it's not gonna be a major factor. But if you can get it up towards 75%, uh, then I think it will be a very useful buffer against uh, this spreading. Um, and that's what some countries have adopted. Uh, and in a way, the theory was right. It just, most people's health service was overwhelmed before they could get to that level. Um, there's nothing wrong with the theory. It's just the, the practice uh, depends on having a huge health service to, to deal with it in the first place. Final question. In the United States, there's been lots of discussion around um, different uh, responses to the virus, depending on socioeconomic status, ethnicity, comorbidities. Um, what things are you analyzing with scientists in the United States and here around some of those topics? in this data set. I can maybe pick up part and then maybe Tim comment some more. So um, one thing that we plan to do is actually to add a question on um, ethnicity, which we didn't originally put in because we tried very hard to ask for as little personal information as possible that was seen as valuable. And you know, when uh, Tim and I were talking with a number of other clinicians at the very beginning, there wasn't a big focus on this. There was a big focus on things like um, diabetes and subsequently there's been very clear data um, in both the US and the UK. Um, and so the plan is to add those questions to help the analysis to try and um, unpick something that, you know, Tim can, can add on where, you know, it's, it's it, these are often um, overlapping issues uh, where, you know, in a number of cases, there are issues often tied back down to deprivation and, and nutrition, um, and we hope that will help us to un, unpick it. Tim, what, what, would you, what would you add? Yeah, so certainly in the US where it's even more marked, um, ethnic minorities who are poor in, in poor urban areas are having like five to 10 times the risk of severe disease. And there's an increasing belief that uh, having an unstable metabolism with diabetes, obesity, uh, poor diet and poor gut health, and maybe the microbiome being compromised, which is so crucial for our immunity, is a big factor. So um, I think we're going to see in the next few months, 
uh, things like uh, diet and health uh, coming into the into the into play here uh, as one of the big modifiable risk factors we could we could do for populations at risk. That um, you know, and and time will tell. But we know that your diet and your microbiome and your gut health are absolutely crucial for immunity, and so. This could be one unifying reason why these groups are, are suffering so badly at the moment. Great. Thanks so much for your time, Tim. Jonathan, um, in the chat, I have typed in the website. Many of you have asked, um, where do I find the blog posts? You can find them on covid.joinzoe.com. Um, that's covid.joinzoe.com, and I've, I've popped it into the chat. We will have this webinar, as well as our previous webinars, on the blog. Um, you can also get access to our research updates um, that we've already posted, including links to preprint papers that Tim and the team have worked on. Um, and we will try and take all of the questions that were emailed to us ahead of this webinar and some that we um, had on the webinar and turn those into blog posts to make sure that you guys are getting um, the maximum amount of information out of this as, as citizen scientists sort of contributing to this cause. So thank you so much for your time. We've had over 900 people tune in today. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Jonathan. And uh, we'll see. And thank you everybody for, for logging. All of this is only possible because, you know, all of you are, you know, taking the time to do it. So thank you. Perfect. Thanks everyone. Have a good evening. Bye.